You don't expect to be in a new member state and have the police investigating and interrogating people for writing about politics on the internet. It is beyond appalling. It's shocking. That was the Maltese journalist Daphne Caruana Galicia. She risked her life writing about corruption on the island of Malta, the EU's smallest nation. And she was assassinated just four years later in 2017. She'd written fearlessly about the country's prime minister, his wife, his chief of staff, and one of Malta's richest men. And when she was murdered, her family and fellow journalists wouldn't let it go. They organized protests and gave interviews. And this month, they succeeded in pushing the prime minister to announce that he would resign in the new year. Now, in a moment, we'll be hearing from Daphne's sister and from one of the island's most prominent journalists. But first, a quick reminder of how we got here. Malta's best-known investigative journalist, Daphne Caruana Galizia, has been killed in a car bomb near her home. There was a huge ball of fire. It looks like, I don't know, the fire of hell. I knew it was my mother straight away. I mean, deep down, I knew it. Daphne Caruana Galizia had become known for exposing cronyism within the country's political and business elite. She also ran a hugely popular blog in which she relentlessly focused on cases of alleged high-level corruption targeting politicians from across party lines. Maltese police have arrested 10 suspects in the investigation into the murder of journalist and blogger Daphne Caruana Galizia. The mastermind has not yet been identified. Somebody was commissioned to do this. A man suspected of involvement in the murder of Daphne Caruana Galizia has been arrested. And he's thought to have linked the person who commissioned the killing to those who procured the explosive device. Just as soon as news of the arrest broke, the Prime Minister announced that he wants to pardon the person in exchange for more information. Within days, another prominent Maltese business figure was arrested. Jorgen Fennec is a prominent businessman with ties to government ministers. He pleaded not guilty after being charged with being complicit in the murder of the journalist. Two high-ranking Maltese officials, Keith Shembri, the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, and Konrad Mitzi, Tourism Minister, resigning in the face of mounting pressure. The reason? Their financial ties to businessman Jorgen Fennec. The resignation of top-level officials has done little to calm the anger. We cannot just sit here and watch our country crumble. The demand is now that the Prime Minister leave immediately. He needs to resign. The sooner the better. Local media are reporting that Prime Minister Joseph Muscat will step down. I will write to the President of the Labour Party so that the process for a new leader of the party is set for the 12th of January 2020. On that day, I will resign as leader of the party, and in the days after, I will resign as Prime Minister. Well, this is a complex story full of characters, twists and turns. So let's unpack it with our two guests now. And we're very fortunate to have with us Daphne's sister, Corinne Vella, and we also have Herman Grech, the editor of The Times of Malta. Uh, Corinne, thank you very much for joining us on The Nexus. I could see it was difficult for you to watch that report. Um, I wanted to ask you about your sister's work and how she managed to make such powerful enemies. She was covering politics in Malta and found that she was uncovering corruption and eventually crime on, on an international scale. If you start from politics and you find that you end up exposing international crime, that tells you everything that's wrong with the country. And, and the Prime Minister is part of that problem. And how did you hear the news that your sister had been assassinated? Uh, her son Matthew was with her. He heard what happened and he called me. And I went there right away. I was there shortly after the bomb went off. And she had had death threats related to her work. Did she ever talk to the family about those? Death threats, as in, don't do this or we'll kill you, I'm not aware of anything of the sort. But there certainly had been a series of events which escalated towards the death. Uh, there had been stories which are well documented in the media. You know, her dogs were killed at one time. Her house was set on fire. 
those incidents happened over a span of many years. And there was never any justice for those crimes. Nobody was ever brought to justice for setting her house on fire with the intention to kill her and her family inside, for example. But it really intensified for her when she began uncovering corruption in, in the government we have today when they first elected. She um, saw an escalation of you know, harassment, libel suits against her, a propaganda campaign, uh, you know, trolls set on her, people bombarding her blog with obscenities. You know, threats come in many forms. And when you look at the escalation of libel suits against her before she died, there's a clear sense of encroaching disaster. You know, as one of my nephews described it, it was like watching a train crash in slow motion. Herman, as a journalist yourself, when your fellow journalist was blown up in her car just a few hundred meters away from her home, what did that do to the sort of journalism community, if you like, on the island? Well, the course of Malta's history changed on 16th October 2017. Whichever way you see it, uh, we could never imagine uh, such a crime being carried out. Because remember, this was not just a murder. This was like, it was almost a spectacle of gore. And uh, it's like the people who did this were almost trying to say, don't screw around with us because we'll get you. This is how serious it was. So obviously the journalism community was kind of torn between simply reporting the case, but then really going deep into it, especially when we started seeing indications that the case was almost being delayed, that maybe some people who should have been arraigned uh, or never faced justice. So I think the media was automatically then after so many months said we're going to need to be a bit more proactive with this case and i really think it is the pressure of the media and civil society in the last yeah. few weeks that brought about some results now corinne you've called on the prime minister to resign immediately and we're going to come to that in just a moment but first let's just hear his reaction to your sister's murder just two days after the bombing it's an attack on what we stand for as a society and that's why ourselves as a government, we have total resolve uh, to spare no expenses to make sure that all resources are available to our investigators. Uh, Corinne, you called on the Prime Minister to resign. Uh, why did you feel he had to go? Because he's directly implicated in, in the very least, trying to cover up the assassination. His own chief of staff has been implicated in the murder investigation. And he has been trying to protect him all these years. You feel he's been trying to protect that man? and that, that I don't feel it. I know it. The fact that Keach Cambry was not fired the moment his Panama companies were exposed. Okay, he should have gone at that point or been forced out, and Muscat should have gone with him. Neither of them stayed. Neither of them left. They both stayed in office, and Muscat is still clinging on and has not committed to going. He should be dragged out in disgrace from office and parliament. Did he not announce that he would essentially resign in the new year? Are you, and you're not satisfied with that? He did not resign. He did not announce that he will resign in the new year. He has said he will step down as party leader and will leave the Prime Minister's office in the days after. He has not committed to leaving the Prime Minister's office. He has not given a date. He shouldn't be there today. His position has been untenable for years and it is now intolerable. Why do you feel and now that he has been directly implicated in the assassination? He should not be in a position to have any influence on the investigation other than as a murder suspect himself. Herman, at least at the outside world, thinks that he's stepping down over this, but apparently he's left himself some wiggle room. L let's remember the, the background to Joseph Muscat. He is a hugely popular prime minister. He's won election by landslides. and He's very, very... The party faithful are really, really... Um, they really don't want to let him go. So people, their own, his own supporters are shocked with what's going on. A lot of people cannot understand how he's given a date um, to say that he's going to step down. So he has not committed to leaving the prime minister's office. We are assuming that, Corinne, that this is what he means, that he's going to be stepping down. As it's prime wrong minister. to make assumptions about a man who has spent his entire career as a propagandist. Yes, but then that's the role of the media and, and civil society to actually make sure that he lives up to his words. What I'm saying at this stage is that he is 
totally, there's total confusion in the, in the country. Okay, there's his party faithful. They're saying they cannot understand why he's leaving. There are, of course, a lot of his supporters who are realizing how serious this is. Can you just explain the magnitude of these protests that we've been seeing every day and, and how they are so unprecedented on your small island? Totally. I mean, uh, the last thing I saw, time I saw something of the sort was in the 80s, and they were not as consistent as they are now. I mean, the Maltese tend to just uh, whinge on Facebook and uh, protest quietly and uh, leave it at that. But there are people out in the streets almost every day demanding justice. And uh, it's good to see this because I don't think people are really understanding the magnitude of what's going on at the moment. I mean, if you heard some of the testimonies that came out this morning and, you know, Corinne was pro present there in the courtroom this morning, it's horrifying. There are people close to in, in the prime minister's office that are being named in a murder case this mm. morning. So I can't understand how people are not understanding how serious yeah. this is. And there must be some sort of political accountability for this. Well, let's, let's get into it. You know, um, Daphne clearly was strongly against corruption on the island, and she often wrote about how top politicians and businessmen used or allegedly used offshore companies to move illicit money around. Here are some of her main suspects. On a good day, Daphne Caruana Galicia's blog, Running Commentary, reached as many as 400,000 readers on an island of less than half a million people. She was tenacious in investigating what she called the cronyism that is accepted as something normal, and she wasn't afraid to name names. She took aim at Prime Minister Joseph Muscat and his wife, accusing her of owning a Panama-based company called Egrant that was allegedly receiving illicit payments from the rulers of Azerbaijan. And amid the allegations, Muscat called and won an early election by a landslide. The following year, an inquiry cleared him and his wife of being involved with the company. <laughs> She also wrote about the PM's chief of staff, Keith Schembri, and the energy minister, Conrad Mizzi. Galithia discovered that both held secret offshore companies and described them frequently as crooks and blackmailers. And she was on the trail of a mysterious offshore company with links to Malta, 17 Black. Since her death, journalists working on the Daphne project have discovered that 17 Black was owned by Jorgen Fennec prominent Maltese businessman who is now being charged with complicity in her murder. Fennec was also co-owner of a company that won a government contract to build a gas power plant. The contract was worth over half a billion dollars. Now circling back to those two ministers, Schembri and Mizzi, well they were in government when Fennec was awarded the contract. And the Daphne project discovered that their offshore companies were set to receive around two million a year from 17 Black for services unspecified. Schembri and Mizzi have denied any wrongdoing, but the allegations are now being looked into by a judicial inquiry. Now, if you're not familiar with all these figures, it is a very confusing story. Let's start with the official investigation. Back up to Herman. Now, Herman, we have uh, Jorgen Fennec being charged with complicity in Daphne's murder. Just explain who he is. Well, we, we know him as a very successful businessman. Um, part, he's a member of, of a successful, uh, uh, you know, consortium here in Malta. Um, but he was always kind of tied in, just, just linked to business. Um, so when suddenly we discovered that he is being linked to Daphne's murder, everything changed. And we know why everything changed, because Jürgen Fennec was involved in the power station deal. Uh, that Daphne wrote so much about right. just before the last general election. So people started making all these links. More importantly, Jürgen Fennec had opened these two accounts, two secret accounts, with a government minister <coughs> and a, with the prime minister's own chief of staff. And, uh, you know, Daphne never lived to know, actually know who owned the 17 Black. That's something which came out later. But it was Daphne who actually mentioned the name 17 Black first. So explain what Daphne revealed about Fenix offshore company 17 Black and how it was allegedly linked to the Prime Minister's Chief of Staff, Keith Schembri, and the Energy Minister at the time, Conrad Mizzi. 
Yes, I mean, for, to put it, uh, you know, we'll just mention a figure, okay? These two men were meant to be getting something like 5,000 euros a day into their secret offshore accounts through this company linked to Jürgen Fennec. Right. And in exchange for? We don't know, um, but I think your viewers can't can reach their own conclusions. And, and they were in government at the time yes. that Fennec uh, got that government deal uh, for the power plant? Of course, and this Which happened is... just, be, just before the last election. Let's also remember, the last election was called well ahead of its time. At the time, uh, the government was under huge pressure. There was a power station deal. And Daphne was writing incessantly that there was also another uh, secret um, company that, whose owner we still don't know till this day. So it, it was a government under huge pressure. Right. And an election was called, and Joseph Muscat wins again by the same landslide. Yes. And uh, Fennec is now being charged with complicity in the murder. Shkembri and Mizzi deny any wrongdoing. I understand there's a judicial inquiry into them. Yeah, but there's one thing. Um, Mitzi, there's nothing so far linking him directly to the murder apart from his links with the organ Fennec. But what's 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 uh, your viewers should understand is what's happened in the last two weeks because th this is the thing of film scripts. You know, there are reports that Keach Kembry tried to deliver a message to Jürgen Fennec while he was on the police in police custody to tell him to point his fingers at somebody else. Somebody else commissioned the murder. These are the freaky things that are happening right now in mm. Malta. And interestingly, Fennec uh, is looking for a presidential pardon in, in, in return for information about the people around the prime minister and has accused Shembri now of being the true mastermind behind the assassination. Is that right? That is correct, yes. Um, it, but what do you make of that? Is he trying to save his own skin or what? what? Possibly, but we, we can only know uh, what's going to come out now of the court testimony. But I mean, at least from what came out this morning, um, I don't expect Jürgen Fennec to just walk away an innocent man because some of the evidence is, is, is devastating. From, against from what I understand, the, the prime minister himself uh, hasn't been accused of having a role in Daphne's assassination, or uh, I missed something? The, Minister, the office of the Prime Minister is directly implicated in the murder plot in the form of Keach Kembri. Keach Kembri remained in the Prime Minister's office. He was directly trying to interfere in the interrogation of Fennec while he was the Prime Minister's chief of staff. If the Prime Minister didn't know what was happening, he should go because he's incompetent. If he knew what was happening, he's complicit and he should go, definitely. Herman? There really are no two ways about this. I don't know why anyone's even discussing such matters. The Prime Minister should go. He is a danger to the investigation and a threat to security in Europe because he allowed his chief of staff to sit in on meetings with the security services. He acquired information which he used to tip off the suspects who have now been indicted. And they knew about their arrest before they were arrested. At the very minimum, the Keach Cambry should be at least questioned about over obstruction of justice because that is clear, I think, to anybody who, who, who bothers to look into Keach Cambry should be prosecuted for long ranging financial crimes. His crimes are documented by Malta's own financial intelligence analysis unit. He has taken kickbacks, he has paid bribes. Both of those crimes <laughs> have a, a, a long prison sentences attached to them. Those are serious, serious crimes. Can we turn just to the three men who have actually been charged with her murder? Are these important people or just hired thugs? In, in our, from what it, it, it appears, they are just hired thugs. Daphne never really wrote about them. They're just very well known. Daphne didn't yeah, write well about them at all. She'd never yeah. ever mentioned any of mm. the men who have been indicted for her murder. There was an inquiry into the prime minister and the prime minister's wife. Uh, shortly after the election in 2017 that cleared them. Do you not have any faith in that then? The Karin? inquiry did not clear them. What the inquiry concluded is that there's no evidence found to support the report. That was an, an inquiry whose per the parameters of which were determined by the Prime Minister's own lawyer, Paolo Lia, who filed a police report with the express intent of triggering an inquiry that would be constrained by parameters set by the Prime Minister himself. Daphne's murder plot was suspended specifically for the an election, which Muscat had already called to be earlier than he should have. Do we have any evidence to support that? It was in court. It was in, presented in court this morning by a man who was given immunity from prosecution by Joseph Muscat himself, a decision he took alone. Wow. 
Wow. And in um, order to allow him to testify in court to incriminate others. Herman, do you know any more about that? This, that, this is, that is correct. It, in this morning we heard in court that the murder was planned before. Uh, it had been postponed, but the day on the Sunday, the election was held on Saturday. The next day, the decision was taken to go ahead and execute Daphne. And was this put forward in court by the so-called middleman? Yes, it was. It was presented in court this morning. So yes. this is a new and extremely important development then? Yes, of course. I mean, uh, now, does it directly link the office of the Prime Minister? I can never answer that. I, I think hopefully in court we will get to know who, you know, who was really behind There was something this. else said in court this morning. The person who was testifying, he, was the, he is the supposed middleman. And as I said, he received immunity from prosecution on a decision, you know, on the advice of Joseph Muscat himself. Part of his testimony was that he was invited to a meeting at the Prime Minister's office. He was shown around the Prime Minister's office by Keach Kembry, who told him, you are going to receive a job with the government. And it turned out that this job was fixed for him by the Prime Minister's private secretary, Sandro Kraus, who himself is still in office, along with Muscat. Okay. So well, this man, who is a taxi driver by profession, was given a job on the state payroll apparently in reward for his role in securing Daphne's assassination. He did not turn up to work. This is what he testified this right. morning. Right. Let's look at the European Union's role in all of this. As we mentioned, Malta is the smallest member state of the European Union, and the bloc has just sent a delegation to Malta to find out what is going on on the island. Well, uh, we spoke to the Maltese MEP accompanying the delegation. We asked her why the EU hadn't acted sooner in accordance with Daphne's family's wishes. Well, there is a general disappointment, and I share Matthew Caruana Galizia's uh, regret, but also frustration about the European Union. But I'm, let me say, I'm cautiously optimistic that the incoming Commission, the new one, uh, will be different. Uh, we are getting ever closer to having a proper, independent, objective rule of law mechanism that objectively looks at all member states. There has been a sense, I guess, until a few days ago, that you can continue to do this with absolutely no consequence. Malta is not Joseph Muscat, Malta is not Keach Kempe. Malta is those people who are out in the street wanting justice and wanting Malta's reputation and credibility to be restored. That was Roberta Metzola, one of Malta's six MEPs. Uh, Corinne, if I could ask you about the role of the European Union, uh, are you disappointed in what they've done so far? There are problems, and I'll give you an example. The first vice president of the outgoing commission, when he last came, this is the person in charge of the rule of law enforcement in Europe. When he last came to Malta, it was to campaign for Joseph Muscat, because Joseph Muscat had ambitions to replace Donald Tusk as mm. president of the European Council. So that clearly shows that the European Union needs a rule of law mechanism, and it needs it now. It appears that the incoming commission will be moving forward with that, and that is, is a good thing. Do you think that the investigation going forward will be thorough, fair and transparent? As long as Muscat is in office, it definitely can't proceed. The evidence trail has to be followed all the way to the end, independently and impartially, and there have to be real consequences for everybody involved in Daphne's murder. Mm. It can't proceed as long as Joseph Muscat is in office, and it certainly can't proceed as long as he's in a position to influence the investigation. As Prime Minister, he has access to classified information. Um, and and we've there's, already there's seen a, what has reason, happened there. There's a reason behind all this anger, and, and I can understand, you know, all this. As we're speaking, Kish Cambry is a free man. He was questioned last week in, in connection with, with, with the murder and released. The only statement we have received about from the police in this all this case is that Keach Kember has nothing to do with the murder and uh, until the stage. And, and, and they left it at that. But the evidence that is coming out from the stuff we are releasing uh, from, as, as journalists and from what is coming out in court, uh, many of people are asking, why isn't Keach Kember at least being questioned with mm. at least obstructing justice at this stage? And this is why so many people are angry. And this is why so many people are saying, is it because um, the office of the prime minister is trying to have, you know, to obstruct, to telling the police certain things, to steer away from uh, the issue, at least for the time being. We're, we're coming towards the end of the show now. Uh, Corinne, I wanted to ask you uh, one last question. And that is, 
really about Daphne's legacy on the island. Do you yeah. think her reporting and ultimately sacrificing her life for the story has changed Malta for the better? She didn't quite sacrifice her life. It was taken away from her. And we do have an, a window of opportunity for change, but it has to be permanent. And as long as the same people remain in office, clinging to power, influencing events, we're not going to change for the better. And her legacy, perhaps, the evidence of which we're seeing now is that more people have found a voice and are speaking out. There's more and better journalism than there was before. Mm. That is a good thing. But we need permanent change. And it can't happen as long as Muscat is in office. And it certainly can't happen as long as people like Keach Kembri are allowed to run free when they've got a whole string of crimes to their name. Corinne Vella, Herman Grech, thank you very much for your contributions and your analysis here on The Nexus. And thank you at home and on your phones for watching. Remember, you can see this and all our previous episodes on our YouTube channel. Till next week, goodbye. <laughs>